Hello, this is Shambhavi. Welcome to Satsang. Satsang is an ancient spiritual practice from India. It means being in reality together. I give Satsang live every Wednesday and Sunday night in Portland, Maine. This Dharma talk was recorded during one of our Wednesday night gatherings. Please visit jayakula.org to learn more about the teachings. You can find video satsangs on Jayakula's YouTube channel, and my books are all available on Amazon.com. Much love to you, wherever and however you are. Tantra means reality, and it means the, the practice of Tantra is directly discovering reality. This means that we don't go in for belief and faith and hope. Many traditions encourage you to believe something or have faith in something or hope for something, right? Uh, it, that's fine, you know, that satisfies some people at a certain stage of practice. But by the time you're engaging in a direct realization practice and you're not terrified by it, or maybe only just a little terrified, uh, you're ready to actually find out. And this is what my Sakuru always said, Nanamayama, you go find out. That was one of her core teachings. She would give a teaching or answer a question that somebody asked, and then she would say, now you go find out. And the beautiful thing is you can actually find out. You don't have to guess. You don't have to make anything up. You don't have to theorize. You don't have to hope. You don't have to believe. Isn't it marvelous that we're given tools to actually find out about who we are and how things work? How, how our world actually works on the most cosmic level, how creation happens, how dissolution happens, what awareness is really doing, and f- you know, what it feels like to be fully aware. You know, reality actual. <laughs> so somebody asked me earlier in the week, uh, what drew me to this tradition? And it's that. <laughs> yeah. I met my first teacher many, many years ago, and I just recognized this aspect of this. I could actually find out. I could use my awareness. I could use my emotions. I could use my body. I could use my energy. I could use my daily life. I could sit down and do mantra. I could use everything, it, uh, anything and everything, and everything that I encounter is aimed at one thing, which is helping this to wake up and realize its own nature. So I just never look back. The word Tantra has a lot of different meanings that you've probably heard, at least one or two of them, right? So I'm going to give you a few that maybe you haven't heard, because uh, you may not know this about the Sanskrit language, but I think that the average number of meanings for one particular word is something like 26 or 27, (laughs) which is really great because then you can play with words. And you can just spin infinite worlds of experience from that, and that's actually what this world is, a world of infinite experiences. So one of the meanings of tan is to do and tra to host, referring to activity and the hosting space, hosting awareness that that activity is arising in. Another way of saying that is shakti, or creative power, the doing part, and shiva, the feeling consciousness, feeling awareness, hosting part. Their union is what this world is. So creative power and feeling consciousness, awareness. Their union is like the union of light and heat that is fire. 
we can talk about light and heat as being separate, but we know that if you have fire, you've got them together and you can't separate them. Same thing with creative power and feeling consciousness. We can talk about them separately, but they are together. There's a beautiful teaching in one of the tantras uh, that uses the words Bhairava and Pairavi to talk about Shiva and Shakti. Those are the fierce forms of Shiva and Shakti, Bhairava and Pairavi. Uh, and says, if you want to know Pairava, Shiva, know Bhairavi. If you want to know the Lord, know this. Know the doing part. And you will know the Lord, because they're not separate. That's why Tantra is not a transcendental tradition. Transcendental means thinking that you have to go somewhere else in order to say that you've made it spiritually. Uh, It could be as simple as you think you have to go to the top of a mountain because that dirty old noisy city or town is degraded. That's one form of practical transcendentalism, right? If you just like being on the top of mountains, that's great, you know? I mean, I like tops of mountains, too. But if you feel that you have to be there because it's more spiritual, that's transcendentalism. One of the other wonderful things that Swami Satyananda said was, there's no noise in the city and there's no peace in the Himalayas. Noise and peace are all in you. (laughs) So that's a really practical way of thinking about transcendentalism, thinking that holiness or spiritual realization or spirituality exists somewhere away from this. But if we understand that this is the Lord, you, this, you, this iPod, pad, whatever it is, This floor, these aerial yoga (laughs) doohickeys, I don't really know what they are. (laughs) These are all the Lord. This is what the Lord does. This is what Lord Shiva does. Lord Shiva makes all of this out of himself. And we call that activity Shakti. So, yes, there are other kinds of worlds without iPads, believe it or not. I mean, (laughs) Apple has a lot of room for expansion (laughs) into other locus. (laughs) Uh, But all of those locus, those worlds, whether they're like our world or more subtle or more gross, are all made out of the same consciousness and energy. So we may experience more subtle forms of embodiment, but we're still in the same body of the Lord. We haven't actually gone anywhere. We're simply the Lord having a different experience. This is the essence of Tantra, of classical Tantra. And this is what you discover by doing Tantric practice. You discover it in your body, in your energy, in your mind, in every aspect of your way of showing up. So another way of thinking about Tantra and what it is, it is a continuity of consciousness and energy, an infinite, omnipresent continuity of consciousness and energy expressing itself. It is expressing itself joyfully, opulently, over the totally over the top. Uh, if you look at all the stuff that's here, man, it's like out of control. <laughs> right? <laughs> the real Ananda of Lord Shiva, the real Ananda is absolute delight in its own essence, nature. Who would not be delighted having created all of this? So the real delight of Lord, the real meaning of Ananda is resting in your own nature and enjoying that. That is the condition of the Lord. When you do spiritual practice and you begin to have real, practical, 
tangible, non-airy-fairy experiences of your continuity with everybody, then you begin to embody that. Not because you think differently, because view is not just thinking. It's not reading something in a book and understanding it. It's insight, it's revelation, it's transmission of our own essence nature from our own essence essence nature. All of the teachings we have come from God, a.k.a. our own essence nature, leading us to that discovery of ourself. And the experiences that we have are completely tangible, practical, and usable. In the tradition, this reality is said to be an ornament of Shiva nature. We could say Buddha nature. We could say nature of mind. We could say Christ consciousness. We could say Krishna consciousness. We could say Uli Buli Guli. I don't know. You know, uh, Ananda <laughs> Mahima. Ananda Mahima just called it that. Good enough for me. Uh, so this this upsurge, this upsurge of Shiva nature, creating all this experience, is called the ornament of Shiva nature or the glamour of Shiva nature. Glamour in the sense of a magical display, but also in the sense of being glamorous. You know, like jewel, uh, the reality of jewels. This world has also been called in in the scriptures of the tradition the mansion of fun. (laughs) It's only fun if you know your nature. If you don't know your own nature, then you're being played and you're suffering to some extent or another. That's what we're waking up from. Other ways that this reality has been described in the tradition is as a theater of communication that as a meeting place that we come, we arise out of the ocean of consciousness and energy. We are an upsurge of that ocean, like a wave arising from the ocean. And we get to have this wonderful experience of meeting each other. Isn't it great? I mean, being here and meeting everyone. It's so incredible. That's why everyone wants to come to the human realm. (laughs) Even Even though, you know, we moan about how much we're suffering. You, don't, you have no idea how many beings want to come here. <laughs> because there's so many sensory experiences here. So, and you know, we have human bodies, we can do so many different kinds of practices. That's why it's so great to be human. You know, if we were banana slugs, maybe we could like, make some mantric sound while slithering around in the forest. I don't know. But we certainly couldn't do puja. (laughs) Maybe, I don't know, internal puja. We have a lot of capacity here, a lot of things we can do to experience and wake up. Other meanings of uh, tantra are literally a text. So the scriptures of the tradition are called tantras. Most of the tantras that we have, the actual scriptures, are uh, of two varieties. One is their received texts, or they're, as they're called in the Tibetan tradition, termas. For instance, the Shiva Sutras. Uh, they're, they're texts that adepts, people who have had some realization, received uh, directly from reality in different ways, and they just wrote them down. Other, other tantras are uh, teaching texts that gurus wrote for their own students. So they have some view teachings usually in the beginning, aka philosophy, but I don't like to use the word philosophy because philosophy implies it's like my theory about something. And these are not theories about something. Uh, the teachings of the tradition, the view teachings, are actually the, what the yogis have realized and they're describing the view that they embody. So we're not talking about theories. And that's why philosophy is kind of a dicey word in this culture. They're also different uh, under those two sort of categories of received texts and 
teaching texts. There are also other kinds of ways to uh, describe those texts. All of them are, by and large, dialogues, unless they're just series of aphorisms or sutras, as they're called. But a lot of them are in dialogic form. And why is that? Because this is a meeting place. This is where we come to have dialogue. So those texts are a living symbol of what happens here, of what this reality is about. They're usually dialogues between Shiva and Shakti, some form of Shiva and Shakti. And sometimes Shakti is asking Shiva questions and sometimes Shiva is asking Shakti questions. Tantra, the word, also refers to ritual itself, the rituals that tantrikas do. The word tantrika refers to practitioners in the tradition, and there are some other words that refer to that also, but that's the main one. And then in, in uh, tantric, in a liturgy in India, words often are interestingly expandable and collapsible. So you'll have a word like tantra and you can expand it to two longer words and then a longer sentence and then a longer one. And then you can break it back down. So this is actually also a living symbol. The way that Sanskrit works is a living symbol of how our reality works. It can be more condensed or more expanded. Our experience could be more expanded or more contracted. So one of the expansions of the word tantra is tanoti and trayati. And tanoti means to expand, and trayati means to become unbound, to become liberated. Uh, And it also means to protect. So all of those meanings of expanding and protecting and becoming liberated are all bound up in the fruits of the practice. We release our limitations so that we participate in the expanded awareness. And then we experience a feeling of, we have an experience of liberation and then we can become the protectors of all beings. So all of those meanings are in there because what happens when our awareness begins to identify more with our nature, this wider awareness, is that we discover natural devotion. Devotion is one of the fundamental elements of reality. So compassion, devotion, are part of our reality. They are not things that we need to cultivate. We need to cultivate letting go of the tensions that are blocking us from feeling natural devotion and compassion. That's how we work in this tradition. But devotion and compassion are what we come to embody naturally simply through the natural process, the spontaneous process of self-realization. People don't talk enough about devotion in this tradition. One of the great scriptures of the tradition by uh, Utpaladeva is a, his outpouring of devotion and talking about natural devotion. And it's really uh, something that we need to talk about more. That the outcome of any realization is that natural devotion that protects life, that protects this, not because it needs protection, but because that is the nature of enlightened experience. So it's not an ethical choice. It's not an ethical condition. It has nothing to do with ethics. Compassion and devotion have nothing to do with ethics. They simply are the nature of this reality. They are just upsurging, flowing everywhere. Another important discovery that one makes doing this, being on this path, is that everything works the same way at every level. So there's a cascading effect from more subtle experience to more gross experience. There's no radical difference between this experience and the experience of enlightenment. This experience is like the ziplocked experience of enlightenment, right? We have to open the ziplock and expand. <laughs> or the zipped experience is what I meant to say, like a file that's zipped.
right? So this is the condensed, contracted, limited experience of the exact same wisdom virtues that we're going to discover when we become enlightened. And this is why Tantra works. Because we can work with what we have to walk back to our real nature, our complete nature. Because it's all here, it's just under tension and all bound up in all these karmic patterns. So we can actually use everything about ourselves right here and now without rejecting anything or renouncing anything. And we can just use everything and it's like we just walk back and everything just starts expanding and becoming more subtle. We come to know ourselves by knowing, we come to know ourself, our enlightened self, by knowing ourself as we are right now. We start working immediately with what is called our real situation. We have to work with our real situation. And this is the hardest thing in the beginning because we want to work with our fantasies about ourselves. <laughs> but we have to work with our real situation because that's where the gold of spiritual practice is. That's where all the nourishment comes from. All the possibility comes from our real situation, not from our fantasy about ourselves. So we have to, as I like to say, go woomph. We have to just woomph. We have to take our own seat, no matter what that looks like. You know, no matter how incapacitated we feel, we have to take our own seat because that is the material that we have to work with. And then we can start having an authentic spiritual practice when we do that. And then the most important thing to say is that in the end, what we are left with is just this astounding livingness. That's completely tangible in every moment. Alive, aware, intelligent, curious, joyful, compassionate, devotional livingness. And it really doesn't matter what the bleep we call it. And in fact, at, you know, after a proper attachment to teachers and traditions, because we all have to go through some stage where we move our attachment away from our limitations and onto our teachers and our communities and our practices and our traditions. That's very, very appropriate. Uh, that's how it works. We take our capacity for attachment and we just move it on over. <laughs> <laughs> but at some point, maybe 20 years from now, maybe 20 lifetimes from now, who knows, there's just this livingness and none of that matters. One of the beautiful things about this tradition is you will read right in the scriptures. Yes, blah, 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 the chakras, blah, 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 the tatwas, blah, 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 the lokas. You'll read this right in the scriptures. That stuff is for babies. It's for the, as one scripture says, it's for the unenlightened. Because none of it is real. But, says the same scripture, <laughs> we have to give people something sweet to taste. Because the, at a certain stage that most of us are at, it's too bitter to hear that none of this, the apparatus of our traditions is really necessary. It's too bitter of a medicine. So we give you the sweets. We give you something to practice with. Oh, chakras are so important. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I've got it. 36 tatwas. I know them all. <laughs> Isn't that wonderful? A tradition that just says, hey, yeah, do this for a while, but really, you know, all bets are off when you get to the end. <laughs> Because when we say non-attachment, we really mean it. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
<laughs> so we need all those things to help us. But what characterizes the way that teachings are given in this tradition and what I'm doing right now, you can suss it out for yourself, is that you're given the biggest view from the very beginning. So in a lot of Buddhist traditions, for instance, uh, not Dzogchen particularly, the tradition that I've studied in, but other traditions, there's sort of the, what you're given the relative view and then you're like stepped up little step by little step to bigger views. Right? In this tradition, you're given the whole view right away. And then you're told, but practice where you are. Practice where you are. You need ritual, you need teacher, you need community, uh, you need routine, you need to listen to what I tell you to do. <laughs> Uh, but remember the bigger view. Don't become so attached to it that you can't let it go when the time comes. So we, we want to have what Chogun Trungpa Rinpoche called headroom or headspace. The view gives us that space. It lets us know the context in which we are doing our little puja. We want to know the context. We want to know the biggest view and then we can get down to the business of doing what we need to do to seat our prana, organize our energy, relax and begin to realize at whatever level we're at. But we do it with this big view surrounding us, holding us. We take refuge in that. So finally, I'm going to stop in a minute. So I'd just like to say a word about Neo-Tantra because that's what a lot of people think Tantra is. And I don't really know a whole lot about it, uh, other than, you know, when I was first studying Tantra, I had two teachers before I really knew what the tradition was. And when I realized what it was, I started going, I went on the internet to try to find a guru, <laughs> as lots of people do, right? And that was really my first encounter with Neo Tantra. I was like, I put in the word Tantra on the internet. This was, I guess, uh, when when would this have been? Maybe like uh, 1991, 92, something like that. And I was like, whoa, what is all this stuff? Uh, you know, all the quest for the better orgasm stuff. First, I want to say that Neo Tantra is not really very Neo. The word Neo means new, of course. Because you can read in the ancient tantras about uh, complaints about gurus who only were interested in sex. <laughs> and, you know, basically wherever bodies are involved and sex is involved, uh, you have people who just want to have sex. I mean, that's what people want to do, right? <laughs> it's not so terrible. But, you know, in truth, for reasons that I'm not going to go into tonight, but I will talk about in one of the other scheduled Dharma talks coming up in the next few weeks, uh, sex is an aspect of tantric practice, but a very, very small aspect. Uh, it's really not the dominant practice in the classical tradition, but the reason that one would practice sexual sadhana in the, in the classical tradition would be to be in the state of the unconditioned nature of consciousness and energy, unconditioned by desire, by object, a desire for anything. So it's a really different kind of a ritual than uh, what I usually associate now with Neo-Tantra and it, it requires a very high degree of realization in order to do it correctly. And hardly anyone ever does. And the, <laughs> I mean, it really is just one other way of getting to experience your own nature. And certainly one of thousands of ways. I'm gonna end there. And <laughs> And you can ask any questions about what I said, about the tradition, about your own path, uh, 
about what to eat for dinner. Anything you want to ask is fine. Well, so we'll just turn this into an open satsang now. We experience ourselves as limited and just unsatisfactory in many ways. That's also our creation. Um, so I guess it's not, I guess we don't take delight in necessarily everything we create. Or I'm trying to, trying to get a sense of, um, because everything we experience in our creation, obviously, so many other things we create, um, we don't enjoy at all. Mm-hmm. And, um, well, right now you're not having that enlightened experience. But I can give you a couple of really good uh, examples of how that, the enjoyment that Shiva nature is, the, is his constant experience, infiltrates our everyday world. Okay, really practical. So we go to a movie and you know, we come home and we go, oh, it was so good, I just cried through the whole thing. Why, is, why do we enjoy that? <laughs> Weird, isn't it? When we cry, when we think it's real, <laughs> we say we're suffering, but then we deliberately go to the movie so we can cry. The crying at the movies is more like Shiva nature. Another example is, you know, we've all created things, right? You know, we've all written some poem or another, or drawn some picture, or written a letter that we thought was really good. And what do we do when we do that? We just keep looking at it over and over again, right? (laughs) That's up. Uh, Right? So we're having that experience of just enjoying our own creation. Oh, I think I'll look at it one more time. (laughs) These are all aspects of Shiva nature of the Lord's enjoyment for his own creation showing up in our expression of Lord Shiva. Uh, I have a question that's kind of in the same vein about emotions. So like with sadness, for some reason I get that that can be like sweet and enjoyable, but with other emotions like fear and anxiety, it's hard for me to find the Shiva nature <laughs> of that. It's, kind of, it's just like you just don't, it's like I just don't want to go there. Is there anything you're really, really afraid of? Like actual, actual terror? Um, in terms of a practice or no. like getting on, an, like getting on an airplane? Perfect, yeah, perfect. Perfect. In an air, and being in a, you know, like, like so claustrophobic. Next time, next time you're on an airplane and you're at that moment of feeling a lot of terror, start doing your practice and see what happens. Force yourself to relax and be in the state of your practice and see what happens. I, I listen to mantra. <laughs> Do like, that's I not being in a practice, that's listening. Yeah. You're trying to block it out. When we're being in our practice, we're not blocking anything out. See, I, I used to be terrified of flying. I remember right reading that. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, until, and I was scared of flying way before I started practicing. But then at some point I realized I could do, be in a state of non-conceptual meditation when I was flying. And I had, it was the best sadhana. The <laughs> best. Uh, you know, what happens is when you really let go and open in the midst of terror, you go into this free fall this feeling of free fall, and if you just hang in there, you're gonna just be delivered to this tremendous openness. It's tremendous sadhana. You know, one of the things that, the word sadhana means practice. Um, One of the things that a lot of us in this culture don't realize about Tantra is that practicing with sex is way secondary to practicing with fear. My teachers did practices with, that invoked fear in us. This is to do this. Fear is a marvelous practice. It, if you, you know, it got to the point with my fear of flying where I was just so grateful that I was afraid of flying because most of us are not really terrified very much, right? I mean, maybe we're anxious or worried or a little scared, but terror? I mean, we don't feel terror that often. And when I would get on the plane, I'd actually be 
terrified. And I was like, wow, this is just so wonderful. <laughs> yeah. I remember you saying last week about when you were working with the health challenge and that um, I guess something that propelled you through it was, um, that, I don't know if it was a fear or something came up where you felt that you weren't going to be able to do the practices that you wanted to do. Mm -hmm. uh, can you talk a little bit about that? It's, through my own experience, with my own health, it seems that the biggest fear that I've been up against is that I won't be able to practice the way I want to practice. Mm -hmm. I well, I was um, <laughs> diagnosed with Crohn's disease in, I don't really remember when, uh, maybe like 1985, something like that. And I met my first teacher in 1987, and then uh, I met my Diksha guru in like 1999 or 2000, I can't really quite remember. But at that, so I had had uh, Crohn's disease for 15 years by the time I got initiated formally. And uh, it was right after I got initiated, I, had, I was in graduate school, I had gotten very, very sick, and I was sort of recovering, but I was really exhausted, and I used to go to teachings and I would lie on the floor and everyone put blankets over me. Very shortly, even just like a week or two after I was initiated, my teacher, told a story about Swami Satinanda, the head of our lineage, that he had been giving a teaching to like eight or nine hundred people and he had told these uh, people that if they did the Mahamritan Jaya Mantra for 108 times a day for a month, that he would grant them all the boon of good health. So I sat down at my altar, I put his picture there, I had been initiated into the Mahamritan Jaya during my Diksha and I did that and I just said I, I want to be a yogini and I was 100% sincere. He heard me. At the end of the month, it went away and never came back. You know, not even like a speck of anything, completely gone. So I think that uh, if you know the Mahamritan Jaya and this strikes you, you can do that. If this strikes the chord in your heart, you can do this also. Did it feel like you were going into the practice with expectation of results? I, mean, see. I, I don't really know. No, I don't know. I just did it with utter sincerity. That's all. I don't really think I had any particular expectation of belief or disbelief. or I just was desperate. There's help. Uh, I've gotten so much help. So much help. And then people say, oh, I don't need help. <laughs> I need help. <laughs> I need help also. Yeah, we all need help. And once you realize that and you're willing to be helped, help comes. It always comes when you're willing to be helped and you ask for help and you're sincere. It always comes, always. In all different kinds of forms. You know, there's just direct help like that. You have no idea how extraordinary it is when you surrender yourself to this life process. It's so extraordinary. I didn't expect any of this. I didn't read Autobiography of a Yogi. I didn't have any fantasies about what was going to happen. I wasn't even interested in spirituality most of the time when I was growing up in my, into my 20s. I, all I did was read novels and go to punk rock bars. I really just, you know, I didn't go to India. I didn't even know anything about India when I started studying this tradition. I went out and I got a book out of the library called The History of India. <laughs> I was clueless, you know? So I had, didn't really have very many expectations, to tell you that now that I'm thinking about it, since you asked. Um, it's not necessary. If you're just sincere, 
then everything just follows from that. And if you're really sincere and you ask for something to be taken away or to be healed, and that doesn't happen, it's because it's not good for you. There's sometimes illness is the cure. You know, sometimes we have to live through certain karmas, and it's the cure. So if we're really sincere and we get what this is about, at least a little bit we get it, which I think you do, Uma. Uh, we know that we're being guided and that uh, even the so-called bad experiences are part of that guidance. anything can be a gift because you don't know yet, right? Uh, Chogun Trungpa Rinpoche was asked by one of you, does everybody know who he was? He was a great Buddhist guru, tantric guru from the 20th century. He died in 19... Anybody know when he died? I forget. Anyway, uh, he, was, he brought the 16th Karmapa to the United States and his students were very close to the Karmapa, uh, really loved him. And then the Karmapa died of cancer in the United States. And one of particularly his students was very, very upset. And he asked Trungpa Rinpoche, why did such a great being, the Karmapa, die of cancer? Why did that have to happen? How could that have happened? Mm -hmm. And Trungpa Rinpoche answered, because 10 years ago, one of his students stepped on a tent flap. So brilliant. I mean, because that could either mean the world is so infinitely complicated, it's such an infinite network of cause and effect that that stepping on a ten flap caused this. Or it could mean, how the fuck should I know? <laughs> and Rupert loved to walk that line. <laughs> Did he ever say what you was? No. <laughs> so when you're at one level, you can't be thinking, you know, how can I do the very best thing, you know, in this infinite uh, constellation of cause and effect. You have to just have your values. What precepts are you living by? Consult your heart. Try to apply the view teachings that you've been given and the things you've realized in your own practice and just do your best, right? Just do your best. Uh, try to recognize when you're being too attached to some dogmatism that's just self-serving. Uh, use your discernment for sure. But, you know, in terms of our own relationships with teachers, we shouldn't leave our discernment at the door. No way. However, the number one thing we could, should consult is our wisdom heart. If you are working with or considering working with a real teacher, a teacher with some actual realization, 
you should be moved. You should be moved by that person. You should be even a little, like, shocked by that person. You should be like, they're showing you something that you've longed to be seeing, but it's kind of like disturbing a little bit. Right? So that's what you should be consulting. Now, there's lots of different kinds of teachers. Um, and we all have different levels of ability to discern and discriminate. That's part of our karma. You know, it's a huge, a huge variety of abilities to do that. Uh, some people see their teachers very clearly and some don't and they're they're all working with that but if you feel someone's really in danger and you've consulted with your own wisdom or you feel you're you should just go with that you know do your very just do your best because you don't have the whole picture yet You're ready when you meet someone and you feel like working with them. It's really simple. Uh, you're ready when you're when that opportunity arises and you are awake enough to meet it and say yes. There's no rule. There's not an intellectual rule about it. You're ready when that constellation of events creates that uh, one situation of teacher and student arising together, and you're awake enough to realize that it is that it's happening. Because sometimes people meet teachers that aren't for them, or it's not the right time, right? Anything can happen. There's, there's infinite possibility. You don't need to know when you're ready. You need to want to be ready. And that longing will, that, that wanting cultivated will eventually lead you to the right situation. Jayakula is a nonprofit community offering opportunities to learn and practice in the direct realization traditions of Trika Shaivism and Dzogchen. We are based in Portland, Maine and Portland, Oregon. Visit jayakula.org to explore more of our offerings.